I am so excited to have you join uh, us for the Owner Insight Podcast. I have a special guest today. Uh, Molly Ironmonger is joining us today from Cincinnati, Ohio, and she is part of our Women in Construction podcast series and super, super excited. I have known Molly for, gosh, more years than I can admit, uh, and we've stayed connected, and uh, Molly and her team are actually utilizing Owner Insight uh, for their construction projects, and just excited to have you, Molly. Thanks for coming on the Owner Insight Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, part of what we are wanting to do is we're, we're wanting to talk to interesting people on this podcast. And you are clearly that <laughs> uh, you and I met back in Austin when you got you and your husband, Sean, were living here and uh, we became good friends and we've stayed in contact, even though you left the great state of Texas to uh, move to colder, uh, colder temperatures for sure. But I am all about the origin story. So tell me a little bit about you and kind of, you know, sort of what got you into construction in the first place. That is a fair question. So um, I happened to be really good at math and science and found it very easy. So when I was applying to colleges, my at my college advisor told me it's easier for women to get into engineering and you can always sort of switch majors later. So I got into engineering. Um, I started at Clemson University where they have a freshman engineering class. And so I sort of I originally thought I was going to design cars because I'm like five foot. So I, women like a five foot woman is not designed for a car. So that was going to be like what I was going to do for the world was make a car that I could actually drive yep. safely and legally. Um, and then I ended up realizing I didn't really prefer those people. I'm, I realize I'm a people person. So yeah. Um, I gravitated towards the guys that were in civil engineering, yeah. um, which is also buildings, which I always have loved buildings. I used to say to my mom, I was going to build houses, um, yeah. was going to be my job. So um, I ended up in civil engineering. I transferred after my freshman year to Purdue. Um, you know, at one point I thought I was going to do architecture and then I had already transferred to Purdue and realized there wasn't an architecture school. So yeah. I started just sort of going to what felt good. Um, and so really it came around... I didn't do a traditional co-oping route. I was a summer camp counselor, and then I went and had an opportunity to go to China for a summer. And then eventually it was time to go find a co-op before I graduated, and I ended up at Messer Construction, which is actually based here in Cincinnati. And I, I loved it. I fell in love with the field. Um, you know, I grew up in Southern Indiana and, and I went to Purdue. So just people that are good people that really are trades focused. I, yeah. I find it such a undervalued skill in our society. And so I, I love it. Um, I then out of school, went to Arizona went and built with this company called DPR Construction, who sort mm -hmm. of like they, they really get their origin from data centers and Apple and Google. And so they just love to sort of look at construction on its head yeah and so i sort of that's how i cut my teeth in the industry and i've now sort of gotten to do all sorts of sides of construction i've worked for developers i've worked for um other large owner institutions and so it's just a really good fun so now where i sit now i'm sort of a jack of all master of none so i really can work <laughs> on um um on really cool things. So I started in a, a company that did healthcare and now I'm sort of back in healthcare, which is very interesting. Um, so yeah, I get the p privilege and pleasure of helping people build health and healthy environments so that we can take care of people. Yeah. And it, I joined the health organization I'm at now in 2019. Little did I know what, like, late summer of 2019 yeah. little did i know what was in store <laughs> yeah. so I mean, it's been a wild ride my you know almost three years of being in the ministry it, it's been a very interesting time to be a health co health care builder right yeah, now yeah absolutely so. well so tell everybody a little bit about your current job you know mm -hmm. who you work for and, and what you what you do day to day get you maybe walk us through kind of because I, I know with the pandemic it has changed and altered you know sort of how you you function right so kind of interested sure. in how that looks day to day for sure so um i started in the ministry of supporting 10 hospitals in lower um ohio and kentucky and, and then and the name of the institution just oh, so sorry. You can... um, i work for bonso core mercy health so we are a roughly i'm gonna get all the numbers wrong today but 36 <laughs> local like domestic hospitals we own partial shares in a couple other hospitals domestically and then we are the largest private healthcare provider in Ireland. So, um, and I want to say we have over 6,000 points of care. So a pretty large, wow. um, healthcare institution, um, fifth largest Catholic 
hospital system, I think in the state. So quite big. So I started my career managing, I um, started within the ministry managing hospitals in one of our sections that we sort of divvied them out geographically for um, me and my peers. Um, and so, you know, day to day, somebody has an idea of we need to change out an MRI, which is a p- big piece of equipment. And you actually have to end up cutting in walls and bringing new electrical. They're never less than half a million dollars to change out one because it's just intensive to, yep. hey, we need to move this desk over here to, you know, the host- a hospital that I'm working on right now. It's a 60 bed hospital, four ORs um, that we're ground up. It's our first ground up um thing in the ministry since 2007 so it's a thing being like a hospital we've done we've done ambulatory surgery centers or or medical office buildings so um day to day my job would be managing the designers we utilize ipd projects so integrated project delivery we had our construction partners on we brought in key trade partners like mechanical electrical plumbing we actually brought in our um design um woodworkers because those details are so fussy and we didn't want to like have the architects design something bit it out and then have to redo all of those so that's really awesome and then in the summer my role has changed within the ministry and i am now our planning and pre-construction leader across our entire ministry so all 36 um hospitals and and when we do points of care so across the ministry we have two you know half a billion dollar projects that we're conceptualizing right now and getting ready to present to the board Um, we have um, about a couple other hundred million dollar projects and then a lot of really good, you know, market specific that's really going to help change them. We are working on a cancer center in one of our Kentucky markets that's really going to help this market that really can allow them to serve the market better. So working yes. on how to support them, how to conceptualize costs, which is one of the reasons why we looked for a software because our costs were like all over the place. And so yes. we're now trying to be, be more um, systematic about how we're tracking costs so that we can then project costs better for when somebody asks like our boss, who is the CFO of the entire ministry, you know, what is the cost to build a hospital in South Carolina? We're going to be like, Oh, I know because we have real data. So yeah. otherwise we're like, oh, I don't know. It's probably $7. We're or- guessing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so what, what do you, what do you think, um, the pandemic, you know, how has that shifted your, um, you know, uh, day-to-day responsibilities? How, how, how has it presented challenges and what efficiencies has it potentially brought to the table for you? So when it first, so March, 2020, when nobody really quite remembers, and it's sort of weird now, sort of where, where COVID is now, it's definitely something where we're learning to live with it yeah. versus that in March, we were literally very fearful of it. Didn't really know how to help people when they got it, which is, it's a very different world when you, when you hear our, our, um, oh my gosh, our like clinical leadership, when they talk about it now, it's a very yeah. different conversation than like in March when, you know, I remember seeing them just talking about like, well, here's what I tried. And they, they were doing a great job of sort of documenting and, and percolating what they found and and so that they could help it um we shut everything down the you know like i i remember we it was like i was supposed to be in a conference called pdc and I, oh man where was it supposed to be it was supposed to be in san antonio and i remember having meetings up to it i was building a garage at our home office because we didn't have enough parking I noticed that our owner um architect contractor meeting and I was going to go with one of the architects and we were talking like, is it going to happen? Like as yeah. the data got bigger and bigger, because as a mystery, we were tracking it starting in January. Sure. Most people really didn't even know about it until like late February, early March. Right. Um, and we were tracking it for a while and then everything shut down. We didn't know what to do. And then we slowly figured out how to turn stuff back on. So in, initially we turned on things that were starting. So um, in in the healthcare world, there is something called USP 800. It's a um, code for pharmacies, particularly oncology pharmacies, that you have to upgrade all your pharmacies. So that's a code compliant thing. Yeah. So we started turning on projects that were a either so half started that you just sort of have to finish it. You can't yeah. just leave it dangling or things that were code compliant. And we got rid of everything else that wasn't really required because as a ministry, as everyone probably reads on the internet, we were getting um, pummeled with like, we couldn't do surgeries and we couldn't do everything else. You know, we are a nonprofit, so it's not like we're seeking a profit, but you have right. to sort of make money on some things to provide care for the, yeah. for the basics. 
So we shut everything off and then figured out how to start everything back again. Um, one of which was the home office parking garage. And if yeah. you, you ask how things have changed, well, the background is this is my office. This is for now and forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the time we were building a parking garage to sit everybody in our Bond Hill corporate office, which is for the whole entire ministry. And plus some of like some city, some city subsidiaries that we have, we have a, um, uh, you know, we are partial ownership in a, uh, building company and a couple other, uh, I'm going to get them all wrong, but a couple of subsidiaries in this building, that parking garage is the most beautiful parking garage you have ever seen. That's never been used. Uh, <laughs> we finished it like, Ooh, early last year. So yeah, a yeah. Year ago, and like the joke, I get calls from friends that are going to the office for whatever reason, picking mm. up mail or to go get your booster shot or somebody has to go get a COVID test. I'm like it's a great parking garage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never, never takes any time to get my car out. That's no problem. Yeah. Yeah. It shifted. Um, definitely working with the construction teams to for field operations. Like you have to wear masks. Like we had all of our PPE yeah. changes, our, our infection control. So we call it ICRA um, infection control. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong. Um, but where we have to like we construction, we don't want it to all the dust that we make in construction in a healthcare environment. We can't do any of that. Yeah. So we definitely took a really big focus on our ICRA measures um we made sure we have ppe hold on just a minute no problem, no problem. problem. so go there and if you need help go find daddy so and it makes working from home very interesting yeah uh, that was one of my four children um so one of your coworkers now <laughs> one of my coworkers. um at the beginning of the pandemic we brought everybody home because we didn't yeah. know and we we have somebody help us with child care and so at the beginning we sent everybody home so my husband and I were both trying to work from home. Yeah. He was working for a payroll company at the time. And if you can imagine payroll during the pandemic was also yeah. a very weird and stressful place. Um, but we were trying to parent and do that. Um, eventually we brought our help back and just sort of knew that we could expose ourselves to COVID because we couldn't function in yeah. work anymore. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely been a weird shift. Uh, yeah. Now the kids are all in school. Um, we added a new coworker. She's a 14 month old Brittany Spaniel, which I don't know where she is. <laughs> hey, Bobby, I'm this is actually the baby this is the baby when we first met and he's oh like, really oh my gosh and we got to go to the doctor today so it's oh no great. not feeling great uh he's feeling fine it's his well check oh okay good so he needs his well check and he <laughs> he knows i warned him he needed it. it's like his hepatitis a shot and so oh. not a great day now he's thinking about it. No, oh, yeah. yeah. So that, that is when we first met, I was literally, I had to pump during our whole, you were doing a, a networking. Yeah. Yeah. Seminar. They in a ripple. Yeah. Back in the yep. day. And yep. um, I had to go keep pumping for him because I think he was like three months old, maybe. Oh. And he was, I had first thought I was going to go be a stay at home mom with him. And that yeah. lasted about three weeks until I really went nuts. And so then <laughs> your networking thing was one of the first things of my foray back into it where I started in real estate and getting into real estate development. But yeah. now he's nine and um, he has to go get his well check, which has been sort of been punted several times because yeah. of COVID still we're in the middle of a peak right now. Um, we actually just got over COVID in our house. Oh um, no, really? So everybody's oh, fine. We all like we're vaccinated. So it's just like a bad headache for five yeah. days. Uh so rough it's just you know who would have ever thought it and now we're two years into this it's just unbelievable right yeah i will yeah who knows i uh, <laughs> i was like this is really weird but like i was rereading the bible at church one day and was talking about like how everyone covered their head and face and how pigs were unclean and i'm like maybe they had a pandemic <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Like when. laughs> there might be a lesson there we should pay, maybe pay attention right yeah, who knows? And I, it's one of those where then like we're reading stuff from like the 1800s, yeah, not 1800s, um, 1918 flu. Yep. You're like, a lot of the stuff was oh, the same. Yeah. It's like, wear masks, wash your hands, stay away from people. It's like, well, yeah. we've not yeah. really learned. Yeah. Also, we've, medically, they've learned a lot. The fact that they could get vaccinations out so fast. I was supposed to have my booster actually the day I got COVID. And now we have, I have to wait 30 days is what. Oh, no my doctor suggests so i've got to wait and go get my booster uh, did you have any fallout from the you know the the first two shots no um no i i was at a one of our hospitals and they had uh they were testing fire alarms so that was funny because there was like 
code red's going off which is what a fire is and so people are freaking out versus i'm just sitting there like texting with the facility guy like what's going on man are, like, are oh, we good we're good <laughs> we're we good. need to find an exit are we fine yeah. Yeah. yeah i've been in line i'm ready to get my shot so yeah <laughs> yep. so uh no uh not not so much I'm trying well to that's good that's good well, you know, so so back to kind of the the role that you play within construction, you know, one, one of the things, you know, you and I talked about and one of the things I think you and I really kind of synced on when we started talking about our software was the ability for it to help you maintain that level of visibility and control. Could you talk a little bit about that and why it's so critical for an owner to have that? Yeah, um, I would say an owner and sort of like in a big organization and especially something like um, a hospital system, all of our systems are built to provide healthcare. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're talking and like buying a widget. So like all of our procurement methodology is really based around like very transactional, like we're going to buy this piece of equipment. We get it. We can pay for it. So tracking contract level costing and retainage and just, um, you know, all, all of nuances of construction management and, and cost management there none of our systems were there like when they were trying to get us to use their it um, project management software which is wonderful for them but it literally doesn't do anything like we're like we needed to do this and this and this we need to be able to track um issues management across our teams especially dis the um dispersed team like yeah. we can't just have excel spreadsheets everywhere because we were using excel spreadsheets and now everything is breaking all the time especially now that it's in this like shared environment or we're emailing yeah. it around and what's what's the most current thing so um for us we sort of rolled it out in stages we have a lot of projects as you yep. Uh, yep. Um, so we we started first with cost and just get everybody to get budgets of projects 10 million and above in owner insight and track the budget so that we can actually see like when we're approving change orders, do we have money left? You, I know what the software, the, where the transactional software says, but like, are we actually, if we project out what we're going to buy, do we actually have money left? Yeah. Um, I have a project right now that's one of the ones that I was managing in my old role and I'm just taking it to completion because it was one of those messy ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was a Nobody renovation. Else wants to inherit. <laughs> yeah, it was a renovation that like the building was kicking back. Like oh. everything we did, like oh, everything no. we opened, it was like every worst case scenario. You don't uh, expect every worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> right now I'm projecting we're gonna go over budget, even though our transactional software says we're fine. We still have, you know, hundred and thirty six thousand dollars left, and so your hundred and forty thousand dollars worth of changes will be fine. And like I have somebody knocking down my door wanting to like buy all of the trash cans and sharps containers. And I'm like, your quote was going to make us go over budget by $2,000. So yeah. no, take $2,000 out of this quote somehow. Yeah. So I think that's been very helpful to us. And, um, I just had a, um, my, my team, we're going to have a meeting with our, our operational leadership. So our, our chiefs of our groups, cause we're so big, yeah. we sort of have two sort of independent groups to sort of walk through some of those big projects and be like, here's where we're projecting the cost to come in. Um, the hospital that we're managing, the total budget is a $200 uh, million dollar project. So it's the biggest one right now. Yeah. And so we're writing a change order that is $48 million, which really it's part of the scope, but they want to sort of see like, why am I, why are we calling it a change order? And we're like, well, cause technically we're, we're, we were doing an IPD. So we were building things as we, yeah. we, we and trying to go faster. We were releasing things in a, in a faster tech, no, tech. So they, they want to actually see that we're tracking. So um, <laughs> we started very small again. I started showing um, the the chief financial officer of the Cincinnati market, which is five hospitals on the project that's sort of kicking back. And like, so here's where we are. It's going to yeah. go over budget. And so he really liked that. And then we have another project that we have very little contingencies just because they had money approved money from a donor. And so we're like managing up to the line. So we're walking through like, we'll approve this, but like we are dangerously close and we still have half the project to go. And so for us, it's also been a great communication tool with people that don't understand construction and don't understand our yeah. like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. We actually have a, a, a platform of cost. Um, so that's been really helpful for us for transparent conversation outside of our team. And then we're starting to use, we were using Excel spreadsheets to track issues. And so that's been this, this month's big thing is I'm showing everyone you can put it in your, um, in owner insight 
And now that we're sort of leaving our, our dens and our, and our basements and going back out into the field, um, yep. especially as this wave of COVID is cresting, you can manage from your phone versus yep. when we're managing it in share drives. Like we can't get to them when you're, I yeah. have so many emails where when I'm handing off to the new guy, he's like, well, where did this, where was this filed? I'm like, well, I, I never got to filing it because I was out on site. So let me find it for you and I'll email it to you and you can save it where it's supposed to be, where yeah. it's supposed to be gotten. So those are some of our, our big benefits is we can manage on the go. Cause yeah. you know, I, people are managing 10 hospitals plus, you know, X amount of sites of care. And so you're never really sitting here. Um, you're driving around a lot. You're talking to a lot of people or you're doing that. So getting to be able to work on the go. Yeah. Well, no, that's great. I appreciate that feedback for sure. And you know, I would ask you like one of the things when you look at construction, cause you've been in, you know, multiple environments, even before the current role, right. You know, if you had an owner that was out there, whether it's another healthcare system or just anybody that's in commercial construction, you know, when they depend so heavily on the stakeholders within the project, that's a kind of a dangerous slope for them, right? So could you talk about why it's important for them to kind of have and control that information so they've got the visibility and accountability? Um, yeah, uh, I can cost, again, we'll say on cost because that's sort of yeah. where we jumped in first. We did not do a good job of like knowing where we paid people and didn't pay people. Again, our software was in, in our mercy world was made for a transaction. So it was made yeah. for like, a bill and you pay it in full. So these partial payments, our system really could do. Our person in charge of pay apps would have to go ask the contractor, like, can you send me your invoice receivable log and like, tell us how much we paid you and like have to rebuild all of this stuff. We had oh to of glory trying to figure out how much we paid people. Yeah. You know, and we also, when, when projects aren't approved yet, like by capital, but we're designing because you have to design some to figure out how much it's going to cost. So you can go to the, go to the powers that be and get approval. So then we have to be like, well, is that cost? Did we put that into the capital project at the end? So for us, it was just like trying to map where all the monies were. Was yeah. and So we were having to re rely on our contractors. We were having to rely on like five people within the ministry and like healthcare has got a high burnover, burnover, turnover slash burnout yeah. rate. Yeah. Burnover, I guess. Burnover. Yeah, we Burnover. have a new term, ladies and gentlemen. This is awesome. <laughs> um, so Molly people, gets credit. Yeah. So people would move. And so we're like, well, this person said they were going to do this. So we didn't have sort of a doc, like a communication train. Sure. So like, we're actually now just like in our communication log, sometimes just typing in like, well, this person released us because that person might not be there tomorrow or, yeah. or whatnot. Um, and then it's also just like, I would always have to email the architects like, can you send me the most current drawings? Because sometimes <laughs> I think I have them and sometimes I don't. So getting it to where you, oh boy. Yeah. One source of truth is what we're, we're saying and making sure that we have it. And for us, it's allowing us when we have a dispute or, you know, like when we're concerned, we, we know yeah. what's real versus like, I think this is real. Is this the right piece of document that we could be managing it? Um, which is really helpful. We're also now trying to figure out how to leverage it in, in our IPD, um, integrated project delivery. So yeah. we do a lot of like, you sort of pre-design. So we're really trying to figure out how to leverage owner insight and the issues part. Yeah. Again, we've been having sort of Excel spreadsheets that we manage around, but now that we can have one sort of issues log that's cloud-based that everybody can update the same one yeah. is, is becoming really helpful to us um, <coughs> so that it can be like, I was in a meeting yesterday and we were talking about central utility plants on this project. And it's a half a billion dollar project. Should the project, should the central utility plant be attached, be modular. And so that's now an issue that we've got to decide when it needs to be done. Yeah. Um, and, and IPD is changing construction from like a waterfall approach of design, bid, build to more of an agile approach where you, you pick what you have to decide now and you sort of let some stuff be gray, which is really uncomfortable for people sure. um, in, in the traditional world. So, you know, part of those issue logs is the due dates is like, I know we used to always decide, I'm going to just make something up tile color day one, but yeah. you don't really have to decide color. You can basically say, we're going to, we're going to make tile at seven dollars a square foot and by x day we have to decide what that the particulars yeah is. yeah um and so it's those are some of those things so it's letting us say like what's actually needed to be decided now and what's just something we need to decide someday yeah but it's not it's not today and not lose track of it because that's the other thing is you eventually if you don't 
make a list, eventually it's like, oh crap, we, we yeah. missed a decision. We missed, you know, we missed our exit back yep. there. Yep. So, like it right now, one of my issues for project care, <laughs> which is the 60 bed hospital I'm working on is we need to find an artist to make a cross. And like, nobody really knows how to go curate a piece of art in our team. So we're all like asking people. So we're like, we've got a tickler by the end of this quarter that we've got to find an artist because we think there's a pretty big lead time for like a 20 foot tall cross, but no, no, You don't no. really know. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of our things like, we should figure that out by this date. Otherwise it might not be there when we open. And so those are certain things that we look for. Well, so everything you know you just shared, I think, really comes down to visibility and having the you know having that structure that really doesn't put you beholden to any of the stakeholders on the project necessarily, but allows you to maintain control and really plan more efficiently, uh, have that oversight and visibility. And I think you know one of the things that we see in a lot of environments is you know the owners like, hey, look, I just want to get my building, and so I trust the people that we've gone out to bid and we've hired. And you know you can't always do that because sometimes you know those stakeholders know and can take advantage of those situations, right? Totally. I will also say for us in the big organization that we are, the allowing us to provide a really concise messaging outside of our department, because we almost are like an internal owner rep is sort of the best yep, way to yeah. describe what we are. We are all really experts in our field. We are not healthcare operations. So like people that sit in my seat in different operations, in different healthcare organizations, sometimes they're just an operational person that got voluntold to do, <laughs> um, construction one day. And so our team, we found it equally as good for communicating outward in our, in our own group. It's like, here, trust us. We've got all of this information. It's not just getting managed in a silo here. You can see it. And yes, we have it for our, our external partners, but internally it's been just as, just as beneficial in that big organization that yeah. we can show people where we actually are tracking it. Trust us, but verify. And by yeah. verify here, look here's the data. Asking. Yeah. Yeah. We'll show you. Yeah, absolutely. Cause we aren't making decisions necessarily. Our job is really to communicate like right now on that 60 bed hospital. There's a, I don't know if you, so windows in, in our hospitals, we can either make them plain and put blinds on the outside. That's an infection control issue. Cause there could be goobies that get on the blinds. So you can then put the blinds inside the windows which is good, but then those blinds sort of break. And if they ever break, you have to like replace the whole windows or they have Ooh. something called switch glass, which you have a little electric current. And when you flip it, it grays it out. Oh yeah. So right now we cut that out initially in our, in our IPD process, we couldn't fund it because we have target values. Like we have X amount of dollars for interior glass and we couldn't fit the switch glass, but we're now in the point where we could add it back in based on our projections. And so I'm showing them like, yeah, we could add it back in. It's $125,000. And I can show you we can because we are tracking right now half a million dollars yeah. under budget and we haven't touched any of our contingencies yet. So if you'd like to add it back in, you can. And so that's what's again, internally. And we're talking, especially on some of these big jobs, we're talking big dollars. Yeah. Um, so it's allowing us to give them um, peace of mind when they want to add back in some of those um, valued things that we had to cut out to hit our budgets and we're trying to make it so they could add it back in if they want in a timely manner. Cause like if we bought all the glass, we wouldn't be able to add it back in. Cause then we'd have to yeah. pay to restock and pay back. So it's good that's, for us. That's pretty huge. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Well, you know, I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I want to wrap this up a little bit, but you know, can I ask you one, you know, specific question? What, what from your perspective has been the most surprising thing about, construction as it's evolved through this pandemic um i would say not surprising but this is something that is coming like everyone's talking about material supply chain in our yeah. our our um and why that's causing construction pricing to go up and i i feel like that's the tip of the iceberg i think just like we're seeing with nurses like we don't have enough people people yeah <laughs> um, to do the work going forward so i think that's what's and I think the pandemic has accelerated it. You know, uh, when I came back from Texas and I joined a company here in Cincinnati, you, we were very proud to say our average age of our field guys was 55. And, you know, like, I'm like yeah. anybody else nervous about this number? But, <laughs> but to take that now, um, six years later, the average age is now almost 60. A lot of those guys just said, I'm done. And, yeah. they, don't have, and they didn't come back and they're not gone. Wow. Especially in healthcare, where you know, like, I don't need to build inside a hospital. I can go build something else. Like, I can go build a house. I can go build something else. I don't need to be in the hospital that's that's really goobery. Like, yeah, 
their stuff. So I think that's been very interesting to watch. And I think it's sped it up. I think it's so the conversation in construction about prefabrication yeah, about, you know, robots have come back. I don't think it'll ever replace people. It's more of like, we don't have people, so we've got to start being creative. So, yeah. you know, in, in my mid thirties to, you know, mid 40 year old peer group in, in construction, we talk about it is like, we really got to think about it because how we were taught isn't going to be able to carry forward. Like it's just not, I I'm geeking out watching this little like um, layout robot on, yeah. on LinkedIn right now that I'm like, I want to see this thing in action. And then like at project care, we're building a tent and we're going to be prefabricating stuff on site, like in a mini factory. Um, you've heard it like in, pods we're not going to do pods because sure. we did a cost analysis of driving the pods but we're going to like build things like crane them in on site because we couldn't find a warehouse so they're, they're going to start to see some innovation just like owner insight yeah in our industry it's ready it's prime for disruption yeah oh that's well that's pretty awesome that's a great observation and you're right not not a lot of people are talking about that they're yeah you know, everybody's focused on the increase in cost and is you know the inflation change in the last two years but you know, you've got to have people that are still going to build, you know, you're buying these things and you've got to be, you got to have people to put it together. And in some of that, you know, some of the industry's not coming back. So. No. And people have gotten rid of trade schools. Like yeah. this one of the first, it's like was home ec. Now people don't know how to cook. Now yeah. we've gotten rid of trade programs inside high schools, or you have to go to a different school, which sort of stigmatizes going into the trades where it's yeah. just like, you know, I, I advise people all the time. It's like, if your kid's not ready, go have them do the trades and then they can go to college if they want. But like, then they know the trade and they can always fall back on like, I can go plumb a house if I yeah. need to. to yeah. Make and, and, and make great money doing it. Right. <laughs> great. is uh, uh, Some of these guys, <laughs> one of my parents told me, and I forget which one is like, wealth looks a lot like overalls. It's like some of these guys, man, a good yeah. plumbing superintendent right now, <laughs> they are <laughs> Very good industry to be in. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, I mean, I can talk to you for hours, but I know you got a lot going on and a busy day ahead, but I, I uh, want to just thank you for coming on to the Owner Insight Podcast. You are uh, not only a good friend to me, but uh, it's been so fun to work with you in a professional capacity. I mean, you are um, sharp as they come and I'm just so <laughs> grateful. I learned I learn something from you every time we have a conversation. So I'm, I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And you know, we'll, we'll definitely have you back on the, on the show. Cause there's more to discuss, you know, the yeah, next sure. year alone will be interesting to see how everything unfolds. Right. Yeah. And if you guys ever want to come see our, our tent of glory and if you're ever in, the, yeah. in the Midwest, like I'm getting ready to show people, I'm really excited. Our tent's coming in the first quarter or second quarter. So we're going to see how this tent goes. It's literally everyone's first time. So it's like, we're going to see how it goes and see what messes we make and figure it out. Are you, are you going to think about posting some of that on LinkedIn? And if so, could you maybe share that information with people so how they could get in touch with you or maybe follow that progress? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not as good at posting on social media, but I am working on it. It's sort of one of my things I should do. Yeah. Um, but I can be found on LinkedIn. So my name is Molly Ironmonger, um, like a monger of yep. iron, sort of like fishmonger. But, <laughs> um, so you can find me. And then, um, yeah, you can definitely, I, I will work on posting. We just had our foundation blessing the other day. And so I'll work on sharing Ooh. that from our contractor because we we are a Catholic institution. So we, we like to make sure that we bless the places that we serve. Um, so yeah, definitely. And then share some of the cool stuff of things that we're trying. We're really trying to be experimental and, and do what's best in the long run for our ministry. That's awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the time today. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, we will, we'll get you back because there's more awesome. to talk about. Awesome. Talk to you later, Steve. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye.